Brad, uh, Brad Yates, and he's going to tell us about associated top quark production uh, using EFT at CMS. So, Brent, can you go ahead, please? Sure, okay. Uh, first, let me uh, thank the conveners for inviting me to give this talk and for allowing me to focus on our recently published CMS result. It's now in the journal High Energy Physics. So, as was mentioned, this is a talk on using uh, associated top work production to probe new physics within the framework of effective field theory. Um, so just a, a quick slide on some motivation for new physics. Um, so the standard model, it, it's a wonderfully precise uh, piece of work, but it only accounts for 5% of, of the known universe. Uh, shortcomings include dark matter and dark energy. Um, are there invisible particles, uh, non-zero vacuum energy, the hierarchy problem, why is the Higgs mass uh, on the order of the um, on the order of the electroweak scale? But, uh, uh, and then we have the Planck mass is, is much, much higher. Uh, and then uh, we have a signs of baryon uh, asymmetry. Why do we live in a universe devoid of antimatter? So I'll just point out real quick that after the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, the LHC has provided no definitive evidence of anything unexpected. There were some recent results from LHCB, which may indicate something new, but we're not sure yet. Um, so if we assume for a minute that the, the scale of new physics is beyond the scale of the LHC, how might um, new physics appear at the LHC? Uh, and that brings us to the idea of effective field theory, where new physics at scales beyond what the LHC can directly probe can be approximated by expanding terms of higher uh, dimensional operators as D, um, which purely consist of standard model fields. So these operators are suppressed by powers of the energy scale lambda, and the strength is controlled by the Wilson coefficient, so the CI is in my equation. Now I'll point out um, dimension five uh, operators violate lepton number, really all odd dimension uh, violate lepton number, but we're, this is perturbative, so really it's five is the most important. We'll, we'll skip that due to this violation, and we'll focus on dimension six. Uh, again, because um, higher order dimensions are suppressed by additional terms of lambda, so they're much, much smaller corrections. So a quick overview of our analysis. It's a novel technique uh, used to examine data collected in 2017. Performs a global fit across all processes, including signal and background. We probe EFT effects using multi-lepton final states. Uh, the procedure helps constrain systematic uncertainties. And all correlations rely solely on the data, so no assumptions are made. And we use a, a set of channels, TTL new, TTLL, TLLQ, TTH, and THQ, where specifically we ignore the Higgs to, to BB um, decay. So the leading decays for the Higgs are the, the WZ and the tau pairs. So a quick word on EFT parameterization. This is kind of the part of our analysis. So the matrix elements uh, can be split into standard model and effective field theory terms. So we have the matrix element due to purely standard model, and then this extra term similar to the Lagrangian showed a few slides back. So we can, um, it's important to, to note that the cross section de uh, depends quadratically on the uh, matrix elements. So we can parameterize the cross section in terms of uh, standard model term. So this S0, we have interference term S1, we have pure uh, EFT terms S2, and then we have interference between EFT terms S3. And so the reason I have this W here is because um, we can think of each individual event as an as a infinitesimal piece of the cross section. Uh, and each event carries an event weight. So um, by this logic, we can sum all the event weights to get the, the predicted event yields. So each, each event now carries this same parameterization as the cross section. So here's a little pictorial diagram of our parameterization. Basically, each, each event really does have its own weight. And so as we fill a histogram with a special histogram that we've created, um, the, the, the weights get stored along with it. So we have event weight one, event weight two, et cetera, and they're all quadratic uh, functions. So then, as I mentioned before, we can sum all these weights 
to get the expected event yield. And since quadratic uh, polynomials are a uh, form a ring, we can just sum them all together and with no issue. Um, and then as we adjust these Wilson coefficients, the event yields will change up or down. So you can see we're moving up or down this quadratic curve. Um, so a little bit more on our parameterization. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations are generated uh, with non-zero Wilson coefficients. This is important because we can't hope to reweight to a portion of our phase space if we start off with uh, certain things being excluded completely. Uh, we do include extra partons uh, when possible um, because our samples are uh, leading order only. So this gives us a little bit of extra corrections. The uh, initial values are chosen uh, to include all the relevant phase space, as I mentioned, and also to optimize the statistical power. This is because um, the, stat, the statistics go as the sum of the square of the weights. So if we had a few events with large weight and a bunch of events with negligible weight, this wouldn't be very good. We'd have a very low statistical power. So we want to optimize that. The way to beat of each event uh, accounts for a variation in the yield of the effective field theory. And we use these to solve for the constants in the quadratic uh, fit that I showed in the previous slides. And then this uh, parameterization is what we use to actually fit for the Wilson coefficients. So uh, we are using the DIM6 top EFT model. Uh, EFT simulations are generated in MadGraph, AMC, and NLO, using again the DIM6 top model. Um, these are the basic configurations. I, I won't read them all, they're here for completeness. The important ones are the, the Warsaw basis. Um, we assume uh, lepton universality. Uh, I kind of mentioned briefly before, only tree level simulations are possible currently. Um, so we pick the top 16 operators, which we are the most sensitive to, which have the largest impact on our signal processes and a relatively small impact on the TT bar background, just because we don't want our backgrounds to also be dependent on the effective field theory. So here is a list of our model operators. I will point out, if you look carefully at this table on the right, you do see imaginary components. But for this analysis, we only focus on the real components um, as the uh, imaginary coefficients are uh, can lead to CP violation and they are well constrained by electron EDM uh, experiments as well as um, uh, B, meson, uh, B meson to uh, excess uh, gamma decays. And uh, here I give a few uh, Feynman diagrams showing uh, a couple of key operators. The top one is OTW and the bottom one is OTL, just to show some of the effects um, that, that we expect. So a uh, brief word on our event selection. The analysis is split into lepton categories as well as jet multiplicity. This includes both light jet and VTAG jets. Uh, BDT is applied to separate prompt from non-prompt leptons. This is very important. And the final states observables are an admixture of processes. Our method does not require that we separate each process, say TTH and TTL nu. Um, these diagrams are just to show um, kind of how these different selections kind of um, can give us purer samples, but we don't have to get an absolutely pure sample each on its own. And then I've said this before, but it's, it's worth repeating. Each analysis bin stores the sum of the quadratic coefficients. Uh, therefore, uh, the event yields are fully parameterized by these Wilson coefficients, the 16, which we are exploring. Here's a bit more on our event categorization. Uh, so you can see the different lepton categories as well as the jet categories. Um, so we have the two leptons, same sign, where we, uh, so it's explicitly same sign. Uh, we look at four, five, six, and seven or more jets, as well as two, uh, two or more B jets, where one is a medium uh, tag jet and the other one's a loose or medium. And these definitions are down here. The loose jet is, the algorithm has an 85% efficiency and a 10% um, chance that a light quark, uh, a light jet or, or quarks, um, are misreconstructed as a B jet. And the medium tag is 70% efficiency and a 1% chance of light jets being mistagged. We also have a three lepton category where we look for the sum of the, the charges um, is not zero, which makes sense for, for three leptons. Um, so we have two, three, four, five or more jets as well as one B jet or two or more B jets. We also have the subcategory 
where we look uh, for on shell Z bosons. So this is um, same flavor opposite sign, elect so electrons or muons within the Z mass window. This gives us additional sensitivity. And then finally, there's the uh, four or more lepton case where we look for two, three, or four or more jets and more than two or more B jets. Again, one medium, one loose or medium. Uh, so the misidentified lepton background is, is, is a very important thing that we need to get a handle on. So we use a data-driven method. We take, we, we compute the probability of non-prop leptons uh, passing the prompt cuts, uh, which is measured in a, a multi-jet uh, QCD uh, enriched uh, region of the data. So it's a, a, a data sidebands. And then we apply this to a uh, application region, which uh, is closer to our signal region, but still contains, uh, it's still expected to contain non-prop uh, leptons so that we can uh, adjust and then uh, we, can, we can actually do a subtraction and, and get an estimate of, of uh, what our actual signal region will contain. Now on to our fitting procedure. So each bin in our analysis is treated as a Poisson experiment with the probability of observing uh, the data. Uh, we have a profile likelihood, um, which is simultaneously fits um, all bins extracted, uh, sorry, and this is extracted at the two sigma confidence level of the, of the uh, various Wilson coefficients. And we, we perform two different fitting procedures. The first one is when the single Wilson coefficient is scanned and the other 15 are treated as unconstrained nuisance parameters. This is the more physical of the two as there's really no reason to expect that new physics will only favor one Wilson coefficient. The alternative is we scan a single Wilson coefficient and fix the other 15 to their standard model value of zero. This is an extreme scenario where uh, nature would only have a single Wilson coefficient uh, and nothing else. Uh, so the ability to fit in this case is limited by the lack of knowledge of the other 15. And we'll see in a bit that uh, when this happens, one has to compensate for um, fluctuations in the data as well as other um, constraints that are provided by including additional coefficients. So here is an example of our event yields. Uh, these are the 35 analysis bins. And this is at the standard model only. So what I'll do is I'll step through these next few slides and you'll see that we're plugging in different values of our Wilson coefficients and you'll see how the event yields actually change because uh, once again, these are parameterized by the, the Wilson coefficients. So this next slide is uh, the predicted yields are um, when we set the Wilson coefficients to one sixth of our final fit value. And then you see it's starting to go down when we set the two six. This is due to interference between the EFT and standard model. Uh, three six is still a little down. Then four six is where it starts to increase again. So we, we see enhancements, five six. And then finally, here is our final uh, fit value. So we plug all 16 Wilson coefficients to their final values. And here's the event yield. And we see very good agreement between the uh, data and Monte Carlo. Um, so I wanted to show one of these uh, single Wilson coefficient scan um, plots just to emphasize what's going on here. So this example is the operator, uh, sorry, the Wilson coefficient CTZ. Um, and then there's the two cases again. One is where the other 15 coefficients are treated as unconstrained nuisance parameters. Um, that is the, this black set of, of triangles. And the other is when they're fixed to zero, the, the red set of the triangles. Uh, so there's a few things you can see here. For one, we have our one sigma and two sigma intervals when the log likelihood crosses one and four respectively. Um, and one of the reasons I chose CTZ is you can see this clear uh, degenerate minimum. Uh, so we have two minima that are with the current precision of our analysis, we cannot clearly distinguish which one is, is the true minimum. Uh, and, and I will point out too that sometimes this also results in a broadening of the curve and this, this will come up again later. Um, we also do check uh, pairs of Wilson coefficients. Uh, this helps us investigate any correlations between them uh, as visualizing the full 16 dimensional hypersurface is just not feasible. So there are again, two cases. We, if we scan over two and we treat the other 14 as unconstrained nuisance parameters, this is on the left. Or if we scan over two and treat the other 14 and we fix the other 14 to zero, this is on the right. 
So you can see a few features that differ between these two. Um, so on the left hand case, when we have the unconstrained nuisance parameters, you can see we have these two basically axes. Um, so uh, along the negative uh, vertical axis, we have better uh, constraints. And along the, the positive vertical axis, we have looser constraints. And you can see that the, the standard model is clearly within this 68% this, this, uh, uh, confidence interval that we have. Whereas on the, um, on, on the, the second case, when the other 14 are fixed to zero, the standard model is excluded at the 68% confidence interval. Um, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying before, where if we only if we only scan over one or two coefficients and fix the others to zero, uh, we're forced to compensate for any fluctuations in the data by strongly tuning these coefficients to particular values. Uh, so they have to compensate for what the other 14 were initially providing. So moving on just to a few of our most important systematic uncertainties. Uh, the first is an analysis specifics on a systematic, which is the one I mentioned before, the misidentified lepton rate, which is a contamination for non-prop leptons uh, coming into our uh, analysis region. And this is again overcome by um, examining uh, and the analysis sidebands, and this is data-driven, so it is statistically limited. So with, with more data, we hope to drive this um, systematic down by a lot. The other important systematics are the Monte Carlo simulation modeling, which include the matrix element parton showering. More explicitly, this is exactly for uh, matching the additional partons which we added uh, to the final state jets produced in, in the parton showering. We also have a missing parton uncertainty. Some samples, uh, THQ and TLLQ, we were not able to uh, generate additional partons due to uh, the way MADGRAPH performs the matching. So uh, what we did for this is we compared our leading order EFT samples without extra partons to the next leading order standard model simulations. And we assigned it uncertainty to cover any discrepancies between these two. Um, this will not be present uh, once the SMEF at NLO uh, becomes available. So we are very interested in following the development of of this, this new tool, but currently we're still limited to leading order samples only. And finally, the last un, uh, important systematic term is the scale uncertainty. This includes FSR and ISR. So here is a slide on our Wilson coefficient confidence interval. So on the right here, we have a plot showing all 16 coefficients for both cases where um, the other, uh, we scan over one and the other 15 are either treat as unconstrained nuisance parameters or they're fixed to zero. And we have the case where we extract the one segment in two sigma confidence intervals. So um, I can mention this before, but when the other Wilson coefficients are fixed to zero, the fit can produce degenerate minima as we saw a few slides back. Um, and you can see, so CTW, CTP, CTG, CPT all show these, these breaks kind of in the, in the intervals. And as I also pointed out before, um, due to the, these are well, these, these are due to the quadratic nature of the parameterization. But uh, because of this, uh, as I pointed out before, it, it can inherently widen the interval. So sometimes you'll see the um, you, you would always expect the the unconstrained fits to have the larger intervals. But sometimes when we fix, fix the other fifteen to zero, this can produce a wider interval explicitly because of the fact that this degenerate minima will broaden the curve. And if you look at our table, you can see that uh, none of the Wilson coefficients exclude the standard model point by any statistically significant amount. So that brings me already to my conclusion. So the production of one or more top quarks in association with additional leptons were used to measure the confidence interval of 16 dimension six EFT operators using data collected in 2017 by the CMS experiment. The event yields are parameterized using the quadratic function of event weights. This is a novel technique which allows us to extract uh, EFT information from difficult data. We extracted the uh, two sigma confidence intervals for each of these operators, and uh, intervals are, the, all the intervals are compatible with the standard model as well as other analyses. This is the latest plot from 2020 from the um, LHC um, uh, Twiki page. And uh, with the, so one 
point looking to the future um, with the full, the full run two data set from CMS, which has almost tripled the integrated luminosity. Uh, more sophisticated analyses may be performed, including differential distributions, and we have begun to look into this. Um, so stay tuned in the future. We're hoping to have um, results by Morion of next year. So thank you very much. And now we can open it up to any questions. Thank you, Brent, for the nice overview. Um, do we have questions from the room? Uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, summary. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how, uh, how uh, was the importance of, for example, scale uncertainty, right? especially for the for some of the major backgrounds um, in your final statistical analysis? Yeah, so the scale uncertainties, they were not large. Um, I'd say at the most, maybe like 10%. Um, so they were definitely not, not the largest, but they are they are still there. Yeah, also, I noticed on page 20, um, I, th I think you showed this very nice uh, elevation, right? So uh, well, um, with the Wilson coefficients, you are feeling the gap in some beans um, between diet and stand model. Um, yeah, I'm actually wondering, um, would, would this difference between diet and stand model has anything to do with, uh, with this theory modeling uncertainty? Um, on some of the process, like stand model process? Um, it could, we, we do perform um, this, I believe this plot is when we, no, so yeah, so this plot is, is out of the box, but we, we did um, do a standard model fit as well. And the uncertain, the, um, the discrepancies did improve. So yeah, our nuisance parameters do allow us to account for some of these discrepancies. So I. Yeah, the answer to your question is yes, to some extent, these model uncertainties uh, can account for some of these discrepancies. How good okay, is thank you. Policy? Was there another question? Uh, sorry, I was just following up on that. How, how good is the standard model fit? Um, well, let's see, we, um, I'm forgetting the exact number now, but we, we found it to be, um, Perfectly consistent once once we uh, what, what, yeah what, once we tune all the nuisance parameters. Thanks. We have no more questions from the room. Um, let's see online. Uh, again. Yeah, sorry. Another one. I was just wondering if you plan uh, any improvement for the. Um, full run to update of the analysis? Yes, yes, there, there are several, um, you know, in, in line. Um, of course, the, the most important is we want to examine differential distributions. It should give us a lot more sensitivity, as well as just, of course, you know, the, the extra data will, of course, provide a lot of sensitivity. And then we're, we're still kind of examining other areas where we can make improvements. Okay. Uh, for instance, do you plan to test the sensitivity to um, four quark operators that you've not? Yes, created? exactly. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Um, yeah, we we have. Uh, I think it was eight additional operators uh, that we have. The we have uh, four. Um, we have too heavy, too light. Uh, we're also including uh, uh, four top um, sensitivity. So yeah, there there are quite a few extra operators which will be included in, in our future analysis. Great, I look forward to seeing that, thanks. Thank you. And there's a question from Ken. Hi, Brent. Um, Please. Uh, uh, is two parts, well, one's a question. But, um, I didn't quite understand what you meant about not being able to match for certain classes of processes that you want to do the matching. And then uh, following on from that, of course, you mentioned Smef to turn low. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to point out that it's this is of course already available in principle there's no the code is, is already public so so there's no yes it, the, the, the code it. is public but there are some uh, issues currently with uh, mad graph and being able to generate um, events properly but uh, to answer your question on the matching so basically um, uh, on the, on those the, the samples of thq and tllq there was an issue with uh, if we included as a 
an additional part-time um, mad graph, basically, I believe it would actually crash. It just wouldn't be able to um, perform the matching on, on this additional part-time. I believe it was because um, if, 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 it, if the, that part-time was vetoed, there was basically nothing to match it to um, in the, uh, the part-time shower model because uh, only, only the matrix, sorry, the EFT is only included in the matrix elements, not in the part-time shower. So there was nothing to actually match it to. I see. Okay. And, and for methods and low, what's that? What's, what exactly is the limitation? Because, yeah, I, I didn't really understand what, to, is there something missing or is it a mad yes, graph I, problem? I, I believe it's, it's a mad graph problem. The, the current versions um, are still having issues actually generating these events. Is it related to um, merging or, or just generally? Uh, processes at next city you want to yeah that one i'm not sure we might have to follow up with the the authors offline okay thanks okay um yeah i think for the smith and no problems uh, maybe it's more useful to uh, discuss in the uh, slack channel I can't hear anything from, uh, from the conference room. Now I can hear something. Okay, yes, they're there. Was there a question? We The conference room cut out for a, a second. Can I ask a question? Sure. And um, please go back to page uh, 15. In this slide, do you cite all wave Wilson coefficient one over six? So could you repeat that? Um, did you start uh, all Wilson coefficient one oh, over six? Yeah. It's it's uh so if on slide uh, twenty we have our final fit values. And we took all 16 Wilson coefficients and just cut their values by down to one, one six of their final value. And that's what we plotted here. We just wanted to be able to step through these values to show this animation. So that this particular slide doesn't have, hold any, any significance. It, it was just a matter of animation. Okay. And besides, they do try as um, observables. I'm sorry, what was that? And did you try as observables? Yes. And how about the result? Oh, sorry, like uh, if, if we're trying this one sixth of the value as in a fit. I think he's like, asking about if you tried other observables. Oh, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, um, observables like PT. Uh, no, so in this analysis, um, we did not feel we had enough statistics to look at um, differential distributions, uh, but that's something we're, we're exploring in our run two version. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I see no more questions. So thank you, Brent, again. Thank you. And now let's move on to the next talk. Um,